My mother always said, I just forgot to have children. But I think it was actually more determined than that. Early in my life, I decided that it was very unlikely that I was going to have children because I wanted to be a college professor. I thought long and hard about first whether it made sense to have children. Um, and then of course I did agonize over the timing of when would be best to do it. Well, first of all, I decided to have a baby mostly because age worries me and you have that expiration date. So in women, generally, fertility declines with age and it's a gradual process after a woman reaches puberty. Women's fertility starts dropping more rapidly in the mid-30s, but there will be some women where it occurs at a younger age and some women in which it occurs at an older age. I actually didn't start working as a college professor until I was 37. And, and then um, it really was sort of too late. Is there any way of knowing when she's gonna reach menopause? When is she gonna have a serious decline in her fertility? Science and technology has now given us some good tools that are sort of add to the information of simply looking at how old you are based on your birth date. The methods that are sort of rising to the top that are being used in, in this context are uh, an ultrasound exam of the ovaries to count the number of follicles. And then there's another test, a hormone test, called AMH, which stands for anti-mullerian hormone. And that test is a simple blood test, and it also seems to be a, a test in which you can fine tune the ovarian reserve of a woman. And so there are now tables that have been established so that you can look at the woman's AMH level, you can look at her age, and you can gauge as to whether her ovarian reserve, the number of eggs that are left for her particular age, is it relatively low? Is it average or is it high? If there were, say, an easy diagnostic test that you could get in college that would tell you when your most fertile years were going to be, that would be extremely valuable for many women who want to have families because they could make a, an informed decision about uh, when they could achieve certain goals in their lives. That's an important issue of educating those of us who train women to become scientists. I think uh, women themselves also need to be aware of all the different steps that they will be taking in terms of an academic career. The tenure clock is a six-year probationary period where you essentially do research and publish all you can so that you will receive tenure at your university. You're judged by your department and a set of outside experts about how productive you've been relative to your peers. And many of your peers do not have children, and many of your peers are men, and their careers are not similarly affected. I was really nervous, really, really nervous about tenure. So much so that the idea of having children just wasn't comfortable to me. I wanted a time in my life where I could really focus on my research and feeling like I was able to put in as much time as I wanted because I was aware that once you have a family, your, your time is very different. It's no longer your own. But for those who are evaluating women in the tenure process, we need to make fair comparisons and take other issues into consideration. And we need to be aware that women have different support networks associated with starting a family. So my partner, he's a graduate student as well. And that also was an important part of the decision because he also has this flexibility of schedule. So one way that universities can help facilitate the advancement of women in science is to offer them the opportunity to detour off of the tenure track. You are now allowed to stop the tenure clock. So you can get an extra semester to prepare for tenure if you're an assistant professor during these sort of prime childbearing years. Another thing that universities could consider, which is actually being done at Cornell in a few instances, is job sharing where a couple who is really committed to having children shares a job and takes turn taking time off and takes turn stopping the tenure clock. And then in terms of research and academics, 
the same sorts of things have happened in, in, a, in a way to help facilitate the promotion of women to increase their chances of success on the tenure track and then helping them even go higher up on the ladder to become leaders. And so I think those are moves in the positive direction. I think this is, this is really a significant change is that there are more men staying home and raising children now. And many of these men and their wives are, are making a very conscious decision, a rational decision, that the women are more likely to be the high earners. I work for myself. It's, um, it's not even about the money. It's not even about the earning power. It's just that I like doing the work. I really, I really enjoy it. And it's, ultimately, it's, it's for me. And I feel like it makes me a happier person what keep us going is just that we all, we like what we do and we are persistent. Still, it's hard to feel that you can't get as much done as you would like. Um, on the flip side with parenting, it's sometimes frustrating to feel that you can't do as much as you would like because you have the work. So at times it's hard because you're making sacrifices at both ends. Bottom line is even when you're being productive and you're getting work out, the standards to which you're held are the same as everyone else, whether they have children or not. And so it's hard to measure up. And I think I just had to tell myself, I will do better in the future. But this is the absolute best I can do right now. I hope my daughter, um, I hope she will do whatever she feels like she likes doing. And if it's science, that's great. I think it's a, it's, it's a good choice.